All right, this morning we're going to turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through 45. And uh, I want to talk about the New World Order this morning and what should a Christian do about it. And um, just begin by saying that a lot of people and I include myself in this, I used to believe this way, that the rapture is going to happen, and in the ensuing chaos, there will be a one-world government created. And that's when it will be created. Well, not true. It's actually been, they've been preparing for this thing for hundreds of years. And uh, the devil has always sought to have a one-world government. And there have been four of these one-world governments before now, and there's a fifth one coming. And it's spoken of here in Daniel chapter 2. Um, here you have King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he has a dream and nobody can interpret it. Uh, but Daniel comes along and he does interpret it. So I'm going to read through these verses pretty quickly here. Uh, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. The images, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Now, the king there, King Nebuchadnezzar, was the first leader of the very first New World Order, the very first One World Government. But who set him up? God. God's the one that gave him the power. He didn't get it of a, you know, of, on his own strength, his own wealth, his own intelligence. No, God set him up. Okay, verse 38, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So you have the Babylonian Empire being the first kingdom. Verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another, uh, and, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Okay, now what was the uh, breast and arms of silver? Well, that was the Persian uh Government, which of course came after Nebuchadnezzar. And what about the brass? Was the Greek, the Greece, you know, Alexander the Great and everything. He was the, the third one, the brass, the belly and thigh of brass. Okay, and where are we at here? Verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now what was the iron? Rome. The iron legions of Rome. Verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of, of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And okay, and and uh, let me just stop there for one second. Who was the Iron Kingdom? Rome. Now, Rome, the Roman Empire, didn't fully collapse. We still have a entity here in this earth today called calling themselves Roman. Well, what is it? Roman Catholic Church. Yep. Yeah. So the Roman Catholic or the excuse me, the Roman Empire, they were starting to fall apart and they saw this great power arising in the world which was Christianity. 
And so the Roman Empire said, we can't continue as an empire, as a political power, but we can continue as a church. And so the Roman, the pagan Romans came and they took the names of Christianity, Jesus and Mary and, and many of the saints, Peter, Paul, and they replaced their pagan deities with Christian type names. But the Roman Empire, or the Roman Catholic Church is just the Roman Empire, is all it is. So the, the iron is still there. And this new world order that's going to come, and it's already being developed, is going to have the, the Catholic Church is definitely part of it. And you see all these big guys, and I'm going to be playing a clip here in just a little bit, where the Pope actually is calling for the new world order. And you see all these political powers, and they're all going over to visit with the Pope. Isn't that kind of interesting? You know, but if you understand what's what's coming, that's the Catholic Church is definitely part of it, and the Jesuits and everything else. So uh, let's continue on here. Verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Of course, you can listen to the angel's message to get more on that. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Hmm. I guess that would be premillennial coming of Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? Yeah. Which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. When Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom at the end of the tribulation, it's never going to fall again. The devil will rise against it at the end of the thousand years, but it isn't going to work. He'll be destroyed. Okay, verse 45, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. You know, I heard a, a good statement the one time. A preacher said, Prophecy in the Bible is pre-recorded history. And that's the truth. Oh, but, you know, we can't be sure that this new world order is going to happen. We, You know, maybe we can stop it. Maybe, maybe there's something we can do. No, it's going to happen. There's going to be an Antichrist. There's going to be a new world order. The Vatican is going to be in control, you know, partly of the thing. It's going to happen. So what should a Christian do about it? Well, we're going to get into that. But now turn over to, or, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. All right, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You know, Daniel, it probably seemed pretty confusing to him about all of this. I mean, he's there in the first world government. He's there in the Babylonian government. And for him to, to see out into the future and see what's happening right now would have been pretty confusing for a guy back then. And the Lord's saying, well, seal up the, the book. You're not going to understand it until people are running. Many shall run to and fro. Now you think about that prophecy right there. Has that come to pass? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many of us here this morning, if you had to walk here today, you know, you'd have to leave pretty early <laughs> or take a horse or something, you know. And, you know, that would have been something else and what about knowledge being increased yeah you know, this sermon is going to be on sermon audio and people all over the world can hear it you know knowledge definitely has increased so we are in that time um, and of course the book has is being unsealed right now it is being revealed now turn back to revelation 13 You know, there are a lot of Christians that don't want to believe in the New World Order. They, oh, that's conspiracy stuff. I don't want to hear about that. Well, I'm sorry, but the Bible teaches it. And if you deny that there is a one world government forming, um, you have some real problems with the Scripture. Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. There's your fifth kingdom. And, of course, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but it's talking about the beast and the false prophet. 
Okay, I believe the false prophet will be the Pope. Maybe not Benedict, but it'll be one of them. And the beast, I believe, is going to be the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Okay, and I believe he'll be a perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ. So you'll have this Christ guy, and then you'll have the Pope basically there promoting him. You know, I think that that's the, the two characters there in, in Revelation 13. But there is a one world government coming. Okay, it's not a conspiracy theory. And years ago, you know, you had to really, Adolf Hitler was calling for a new world order, and then George Bush Sr. did on September the 11th of 91, I think it was, 1991. And there were different people that have called for this thing. But now in the last, since Obama was elected, it's, they're just going nuts with it. I mean, they're, they're calling for it all the time. So I want to play a couple of recordings for those who are not convinced that this thing is real. First is going to be Al Gore. <laughs> and then it's going to be the British Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. And then Henry Kissinger. And then there's going to be a news reporter talking about Obama. And then it'll be Obama. And then Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. I put him number six. I figured that was appropriate. Uh, then we have Glenn Beck. He's talking about it. And uh, then Sean Hannity. And, and he's interviewing a guy named Dick Mars. So let's listen to this. But it is the awareness itself that will drive the change. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global agreements. I think the new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. We have resolved that from today we will together manage the process of globalization to secure responsibility from all and fairness to all. And we've agreed that in doing so, we will build a more sustainable and more open and a fairer global society. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't such a crisis. This is Sky News with Paula Middlehurst. Well, there have been extraordinary scenes in Berlin tonight as thousands of people gathered to hear Barack Obama deliver key foreign policy speech on his current European tour. The Democratic presidential hopeful laid out his vision for America's place in a new world order, saying he was speaking as a proud citizen of the United States and a fellow citizen of the world. Okay, let me pause it there for just a minute. Now, pay attention to what Obama says. And all of, these, all of these recordings here, they're from the Internet, from news clips, Associated Press, Reuters, all the big news agencies. You can look them up. That's all legitimate. And these are all less than a year old. Okay? I mean, these are all very recent. Now, but listen to what Obama has to say here. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. The one way to protect our common security and advance our common humanity. That is why the greatest danger of all is to allow new walls to divide us from one another. The walls between old allies on either side of the Atlantic cannot stand. The walls between the countries with the most and those with the least cannot stand. The walls between races and tribes, natives and immigrants, Christians and Muslims and Jews cannot stand. These now are the walls we must tear down. These are the walls we must tear down? Do you realize that if you are a Bible-believing Christian, you are the wall? <laughs> Think about that. We are the ones that are keeping... All the nations from joining together were the ones that are keeping the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims from joining together. Yeah. Hey, Pope. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order in the third encyclical of his pontificate. 
There is a global meltdown coming. It is a global depression. And one world currency and one world financial system is the end game. China said last week they want one global currency. France said yesterday or the day before that they want one world order, a new world order, at the end of this event. Yeah. And those people who have been yelling, oh, the UN's going to take over global conspiracy government. Conspiracy theorists. They consp they've been crazy, but now they must, they're right. Yeah, well, when Geithner, it's happening. when Geithner said he would be open to the idea of a global currency last exactly. week, yeah. the, those conspiracy people had said and suggested that for That's years. Right. You're not wrong. And, You're not and, wrong. And, you know, it's... So that's it. Okay. So there you have it from mainstream media. They're just openly announcing it now. Openly talking about it. You know, and they're even making jokes there. Sean Hannity making jokes. And he's a Catholic, by the way. Don't be fooled by that guy. But they're, they're making jokes that, you know, all the conspiracy theories, they, or conspiracy theorists, they talked about the New World Order, and now it's here. So we are very, very close to the Antichrist kingdom. It just is amazing. Now, the question comes up, and, and you can study this thing. There's so many facets of it. The CFR, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the MKUltra, the Finders, the CIA, the, you know, HARP, all this stuff. I mean, there's so many aspects of this New World Order. It's just incredible, you know. And we've studied it here. We know about it here. But other people, you know, if you're listening online... I mean, just go to YouTube, go to type it in Google, you know, New World Order, and you'll find more information than you can handle. <laughs> it's incredible. But the questions up comes up, and I've seen a lot of videos on it, and they tell about it, but then they just kind of, okay, thank you for watching. And they don't really discuss what should a Christian do about it. Can we stop it? Can we somehow take political action and stop the New World Order? And a lot of people are led to believe that, yeah. We can, but I'm going to show you that we can. Turn to Zephaniah, back in the Minor Prophets, Zephaniah, chapter 3. Now here's one of these verses you aren't going to hear preached very often. Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 8. Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Do you realize if you say we're going to stop the new world order, you're basically saying that you're going to stop God's plans? I mean, think about that. That's pretty amazing. God has a purpose. And his purpose is, well, we read back there in the book of Daniel, it is the stone, you know, that's that's not made with hands, comes and destroys this new world order. And then it sets and then God sets up his kingdom on the earth. And when you're saying, We're gonna stop it, we are going to put an end to that kingdom. And we are going to bring in a time of peace and prosperity and lovely whatever. You're saying, no, God, you're not going to be able to stop this. I'm going to do it. Mankind is going to do it. Well, we couldn't do it for 6,000 years. What makes you think we can do it in the future? You know, develop a world government or a world where people respect each other and whatever. It's not going to happen. It's God's plan. God has everything set up, and part of his plan is for this new world order to come to pass. And these one world order guys, these, these big elitists, the bankers, the international bankers, and Illuminati, and all these other guys, they don't even realize it because I think a lot of them are on a power trip because they're so wealthy, they're so powerful, they're above the law, and they don't even realize that they're actually falling right into a trap, which is what they're doing. And it's it's actually kind of sad, to be honest with you. But we'll get back to that in a little bit. But look over chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Zephaniah 2, verse 1. 
Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree, bring forth. Before the day, pass as the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Of course, here the Lord is speaking to Jews in the Old Testament. And as I've covered in other studies, the seven-year coming period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's specifically for the Jews. And Matthew chapter 5, you read, The meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, So here you have it again about that they're to seek meekness. It's not about... Let's develop a military that we can fight the forces of the Antichrist. And we'll defeat him. We'll, we'll stop him from bringing in his new world order. No, you won't. It's meekness. It's righteousness. And a lot of these guys that are talking about the new world order, a lot of them will never mention sin. That's not there. It's all the Constitution and your rights and, and you know, freedom and, 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 and that stuff's good. What about sin? What about righteousness? What about meekness? See, that's not mentioned there. But the ones that are going to make it through this coming time of Jacob's trouble, if you don't get saved before the rapture, you're going to go through this time of Jacob's trouble. And the only way you're going to make it through is by being meek and seeking the Lord's judgment and seeking after righteousness. That's the only way somebody's going to make it through that time period. You're not going to stop it. All right, Romans chapter 3. You say, well, I, I just, I don't know if I can worship a God that would would allow the new world order to come in. I mean, this just can't be. It's the devil's new world order. How would, how could God use it? Well, let's look about that. Romans chapter 3. Of course, here it's talking about the Jews, but, you know, I think it has an application to what's coming as well. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, now look at this, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. See, we have the record that God gave to us right here, the King James Bible. And there's a lot of people that don't want to believe in this. Oh, I, I, I think we can stop the New World Order. Oh, no, I don't think it's going to come to pass. I don't know about the Bible. No. Yea, let God be true, and every man a liar. Right there. God says it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There will be a one world government. It's going to happen. Okay. Um, let's finish here. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Verse 5. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Verse 6. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? You know, the reason for this coming seven-year period is God's judgment being poured out on this earth. And you say, oh, but it's terrible. I just can't believe in a God that would allow this, this suffering and the death and, the, and this Antichrist being set up. Yeah, but it's to fulfill God's purpose. God is going to allow things to get so bad on this earth that when he comes and fixes it, he will get glory. You see, if he allows man to fix it, well, then man gets the glory. Man stands around and they talk about the great heroes, our founding fathers and things like that, that brought in this wonderful kingdom. See? Jesus Christ isn't going to get any honor for that. And I love America. I love the Constitution. I love the Decla Declaration of Independence, George Washington, all that stuff. I'm very patriotic. But I'm told that this nation is a Christian nation, and yet you read the Constitution, there's no mention of Jesus Christ. Isn't Jesus Christ the head of Christianity? Why is, he, why is he not mentioned? Now, those guys, they'll mention him you know, in their writings, personal writings and things, but why is it that our bylaws and our constitution and everything, there's no mention of Jesus Christ? But we're a Christian nation? And, and how would it be if man, again, set up a wonderful country? We defeat the Antichrist. We stop the New World Order. And we bring in this great new kingdom. Do you think that they'd mention Jesus Christ? Of course not. No, we'd have our great heroes. We'd have our great men who fought in the new revolutionary war. They wouldn't mention Jesus Christ. 
No, it's going to be, it's, the Lord is going to allow it to get so rotten and everything's just going to fall apart and it is falling apart that only Jesus Christ can fix it. He's the only one. You know, the other message I did last week, Jesus Christ is the answer to all life's problems. And he is. He's the only one that can stop this thing. Turn to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Here you're going to have something pretty interesting. All right, Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now look at this. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Why did Peter rebuke Jesus Christ? Because he loved him. He didn't want to see his Lord and, and you know, friend at that point. He wasn't a savior. He didn't die on the cross yet, but he would eventually, of course. But, you know, here's his master. He knows who Jesus is. He knows he's God manifest in the flesh. And he's saying, I'm going to be made fun of. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be put on a cross and killed. Now, what would your reaction have been to that? If your best friend and your and your God manifest in the flesh and he's saying, I'm going to be mocked and killed. You know, your love for him would have been, no, 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 I, I can't believe that. But you see, Peter was looking at down here. He was looking at life down here. He wasn't thinking about the word of God having to be fulfilled. He savored the things of men rather than the things of God. And I look at this world right now and I say, oh man, a new world order coming? This is horrible. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about America being destroyed and and military police state and all this other stuff. I don't want to think about that. But you know what? It's God's plan. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So what do you savor as a Christian? Do you savor the things that be of men? A nice peaceful life down here and prosperity and a nice home and a nice car and everything. Do you savor that or do you savor the things that be of God? See, where are your priorities at? But let's continue here. Verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, there are a lot of people who know all about the New World Order, and they're just as lost as they can be. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? You know, I mean... I see the Antichrist kingdom coming. My hope is in Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna. You think I can store up enough ammo and food and and whatever else here to survive the thing? Are you mad? You know, <laughs> there's no way. All right, we can stop them. I'll write my congressman. You're out of your mind. It isn't going to happen. You know, the Congress are they're signing bills that they don't even read. How are they going to stop the new world order? How are they going to imprison these big illuminist? you know, globalist bankers and things. They aren't going to stop them. It's insane. Verse 38. And here's what it's really about. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generate, generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Who was the very first to pervert the words of God? Satan. Satan. Yep, Genesis 3. He is the one who's behind Scripture perversion. But what are you doing when you're saying that God's Word isn't going to come to pass? You're doing what Peter did. And that's why the Lord said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. And, and notice too, he didn't say, Hey, 
Peter, watch out, Satan's deceiving you. No, he called him Satan because Peter was doing what Satan would have him do. And this whole thing of we can stop the New World Order, it's all the, the, the philosophy behind it. And it's not out in the open always, but the philosophy behind it is, in reality, a hatred for, for God's word. That's really what's going on there. All right, Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. We'll look at the next one here. I know this stuff isn't easy to, to think about. You know, we all, you know, it's so easy to get comfortable down here on this earth. You know, we have it so good as, as Christians in America. We really don't know what suffering is all about. But it says here, Matthew 18, verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Is the new world order going to come? Yes. yes. Are you going to help it come to pass? No. You shouldn't help it. You should. And there again, okay, the new world order is coming. So as a Christian, I know it's coming, so I should help it come to pass. No. The offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. These big New World Order dudes, <laughs> they can get out of that system. And every once in a while you'll have somebody who will get out of that system. Johnny Todd is a good example. You know, he's He was in with the whole New World Order crowd. He was helping to bring the thing to pass. And he got saved. And he left it. You know, he got out of it. And it's a whole big involved story there, but there are guys that do it. Doc Marquis is another one. Bill Schneblin's another one. There are the people that are trying to that are helping to build this new world order, and they can get out of it. They will, you'd be dumb to say, well, you know, God's word said it's going to come to pass, so I got to help it come. No, the offense has to come, but woe to the man by whom it comes. So again, you know, Romans chapter three verse four: Let God be true, and every man a liar. That's the whole thing. It's going to come to pass. The offense is going to come, but woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. Now turn to Matthew 7. I'm going to show you something else here. You know, there's a law of science uh, which is perfectly in line with Scripture, and uh, it is not in line with the evolution theory. And that law of science is called the second law of thermodynamics. The law of entropy. <laughs> Big words today. And it is basically that everything deteriorates. Take a wooden chair and put it out in the yard and let it rain on it, let it snow on it, let the sun beat on it. It won't get better. It will get worse. It deteriorates. You build a building, it gets worse with age. It doesn't get better. You build a government, guess what? Second law of thermodynamics. It gets worse. Okay? Everything gets worse with time. Everything does. You can't get around that. Let me show you something else here. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Speaking about heaven and hell. Hell, the road to hell is very wide, and many there be which go in thereat. The road to heaven is very narrow. One of the best things I ever heard was by a pastor named Chris Huff, and he said a lot of people have this idea that the road to hell is this big highway here, and then the road to heaven is this little narrow path that winds back through the woods. And he said, I don't think that's it. The road to hell is the big highway, but that little yellow that little yellow line going in the middle of that highway, that's the narrow way. And the, the thing is, all of mankind is walking on that highway, and those that get saved have to stop and turn around and go against the tide <laughs> on that little yellow stripe. And I think that's a good way to put it. Because it isn't, you know, that you're just off in this little peaceful path over there. No, you're going against the world when you truly get saved. But... My point I'm trying to make here in Matthew chapter 7 is the Bible says that the majority are going to go to hell. So then we shouldn't witness. Right? I mean, the Bible says the majority is going to hell, so what's the point? 
few there be that find the way to heaven. So let's not witness. We're commanded to. Yeah, yeah, we're commanded to, obviously. See, but you look at that, you don't say, well, I'm not going to witness because the majority go to hell. No, you witness. You get out there and you preach the gospel to every creature. Here's a track. There's a track. There you go. Well, aren't you going against what God says? Well, in a sense, yeah, but you're doing what you're supposed to do. God says certain things are going to come to pass, but that doesn't mean that you have to go along with it. Okay? There will be a one world government, but that doesn't mean that we should be for it. You can be against it, you know, and then you should be against it. But, uh, well, let's continue on here. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 2. Okay, what can you do to slow down the new world order? It is inevitable, it is coming, but can you do something to slow it down? Okay, Proverbs 28, 2. For the transgression of a land, many are the princes thereof, or congressmen and senators. <laughs> um, but by a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. And, of course, a good example of that is Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And we've been over that before, how that God spoke to Abraham and he said, if you can find me 50 righteous men, 45, and he went down to 10, I'll spare the city. You know why America hasn't been destroyed yet? It's because of Christians. Christians that are sticking to the truth. Okay? By a man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. And why should the state of America be prolonged? Well, so we can get rich, so we can make a lot of money. No. So we can continue to preach the gospel. And as you heard Obama say, one of the walls he wants to tear down is Bible-believing Christians. So there is anti-Christian sentiment. But we still have a very strong Christian presence here in America. And so we're still able to get the gospel out to people. And we should fight for that as long as we can. And God will protect us through these times as long as we are doing His will. The New World Order is going to come, definitely. But He will prolong the peaceful state that we currently have as we are doing His will and as we are turning more people to righteousness. That's what He'll do. Jeremiah chapter 17. You know, a lot of the reaction that you get from people to the whole coming New World Order is they'll do what is written about here in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Now, I'll just stop there for just a minute. I just saw some videos on YouTube of these guys. Uh, they claim to be Christians, but they're into this whole uh, constitutional, I'm not paying income tax, um, I'm a citizen of the state and not of the United States. I am not a federal citizen, I'm a state citizen. They won't they don't have driver's licenses, they don't have insurance on their vehicles. They're into this whole thing and they live in the desert. <laughs> they have all this solar panels and their own water supply and they're into all the survival stuff and of course they believe that they're going to go through the tribulation, you know. What are they doing for the Lord? Zero. Nothing. And what are they trusting in? Are they trusting in the Lord to, del to deliver themselves? No. They study the law so that they can go out and get in confrontations with police officers. I had a police officer pull me over the other day and, and he tried to arrest me and I told him, you cannot, sir, because of this law and that law and I'm a citizen of this state and, and I... I've made a declaration of this and that. And they were getting into this whole thing about your vehicle. You're, you don't say that you're the operator of it, you know, and you're just a, a passenger. And then you can, all this garbage. And they're doing nothing for the Lord. 
And they're making flesh. They're trusting in flesh and their weapons to protect themselves. That isn't it. Okay, that's the wrong reaction. And you got to be careful with some of that survivalist type of thing. There's some wisdom to it, but you got to be careful with that. Because you can get really off base with that. And you can get to a point where you're building your wilderness retreat and you're forming your militia and you're getting all the stuff together and you start thinking, I can survive. I can do it without the Lord. And that's what they do. Uh, look at verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. God will provide your needs, especially if you're you know, getting things done for him. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 9. We're going to see some instruction here for Christians. All right, Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. You are supposed to love good and hate evil. Okay, now jump down to verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the instructions for a Christian. You don't go after your enemy and try to get back at him and, you know, vengeance and all this stuff. Help him out. You know? Okay, now turn to Ephesians 6.12. Here's something else a lot of people don't realize. Ephesians 6.12. You know, I played those clips earlier of, of the Pope and, you know, Obama and Henry Kissinger and all these guys. And, and people start gritting their teeth and, oh, I can't stand that guy. Oh, man, if we could just get rid of Obama, if we could just get rid of the Pope, if we could just get rid of all these. And they forget about Ephesians 6.12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principali excuse me, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Guess what happens when Obama gets elected out or voted out or whatever? They're just going to put another one in. You know? Oh, we can impeach him. Go ahead. They'll put somebody else in. You know? We'll get the, what's, Joe Biden or whatever. You know? <laughs> we'll get him in. You know? <laughs> We're wrestling not against flesh and blood. These guys that are calling for a new world order, they're all deceived. In their minds, they know what they're talking about. Certainly. But they're deceived by the devil. And it's kind of sad in a way because the devil is positioning them to build this one world government that he's going to rule. And in reality, they're walking right into the trap that God set for them. And they're going to be in hell one day. And that's something that we shouldn't say, oh, that's great, you know, wonderful. That's sad. When you think about John Rockefeller, one of the early architects of it, and um, J.P. Morgan and all these guys, you know, all the Rothschilds and all this stuff, they're in hell right now. That's sad. And they know better now. They realize that they were tricked by Satan. See, they weren't the real enemy. Satan's the real enemy. He's the real one that we should be against. And how do you fight the devil? Well, you should fight him spiritually. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter four verse twelve. Okay, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. 
But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory God on this behalf. Okay? You will suffer in this life. I mean, you heard Obama saying there in the speech that, you know, we have to tear down the walls between Christians and Muslims. You know? They are planning to persecute Christians. Now we still have the freedom. I don't know how bad it's going to get before the rapture hits. It could get pretty bad. could get pretty rotten. I don't know. I hope it doesn't. I'd kind of like to leave today. <laughs> but, you know, who knows? could get pretty bad. But if that time comes when we have to suffer for Jesus Christ, when we have to suffer as Christians, rejoice in that day. That's rough to think about. That's what it says. But now, where does the judgment begin? Should you... Here, here again, okay, now what should you do as a Christian? Should you fight the New World Order? What should be the focal point of your energy as a Christian. What should you fight? Verse 17, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. You know, there's corruption within the body of Christ, within professing Christianity especially. You have the new versions. You have the contemporary Christian music, the rock music. You have a lot of areas within the quote-unquote Christian church. That's your main area that you need to, to fight in. You know, and if you have... Fifty dollars to spend. Should you spend it on fighting corruption in the church, or should you spend it on joining the NRA, or joining some political activism group? If you have time to write a letter, should you write your letters against things corruptions in the church, or should you write your letters against corruptions in the government? What are you spending your time fighting? Well, if judgment begins, it has to begin at the house of God. We need to be more concerned about what's going on in the churches than we are what's going on out there in the world. And that is part of it. I'm not saying you shouldn't be politically active. You can, but that should never be your main priority. It should be within the church. All right, now a couple more places to turn here and then we're done. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Now, all these big scary things that are coming and all this horrible stuff and the New World Order being formed and everything, what does God think about it? I mean, it's scary. I'll admit to you, you know, it's, it's kind of scary seeing it sometimes. But what does God think about it? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Verse 24, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Now, has America turned from the counsel of the Lord? <laughs> yes. I mean, they, the Ten Commandments, they take them out of the schools and they take them out of courthouses and everything. They don't want the counsel of the Lord. They don't want the words of the Lord out in public. Verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. <laughs> That's kind of interesting to hear the Lord talk that way. Verse 27, When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Now, 
I just want to make a comment very quickly. There could be some Christians in Haiti. And I don't doubt that there probably are some. But the majority of that country, they were Roman Catholicism and voodoo. Which, you know, is <laughs> two different uh, paths to the same end. I mean, it's, it's yeah, they're very similar. But the fact is, they didn't want anything to do with the Lord. They didn't, I mean, they were very wicked down in that nation. I mean, I read a letter on the internet from a missionary who was in Haiti for years and years, and he said it's a very difficult mission field. The people just don't talk to me about that God stuff. They didn't want to hear it. But now they do. Now they're calling out to God, aren't they? And do you think God's up there saying, oh, I'll just pour out my blessings now, you poor little things? No. And we have to be real, really, really careful as Christians that we aren't quick to support something when God pours out his wrath on a nation. We've got to be careful that we don't join with the secular news media very quickly and go, oh, those poor people, all oh, those poor things. We've got to be careful about that. Okay, I'm not saying you shouldn't help them. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, pray for the Christians there. Whatever, you know, send money to them. You know, go down and volunteer your time or whatever, but take some tracks with you. Okay, uh, verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But look at verse 33. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. All right, now turn back to Psalm 2, probably the most famous portion of Scripture dealing with this coming new world order and God's attitude towards it. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will de declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now, finally, turn to Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. That's where we're going to end. Revelation 6.15. I've been over this quite a few times in different studies. But you're going to see what happens here. And this is, this is like I said, I mean, I, I have sympathy for these people. All these New World Order guys right now, and men and women both that are calling for the one world government. This is the end of them. Right here. Revelation 6.15 And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? They're going to realize that they have been duped. They're going to realize that they have been used by Satan to accomplish his ends, and their great master Satan can't protect them from the wrath of the Lamb. And it's interesting because right now, you can again, you can research this, they are building underground cities. And it's a, it's a fact. I mean, it was just on... My one friend was telling me that it was on uh, Jesse Ventura's new show, Conspiracy Theory, and I'm not endorsing the show, but I'm just saying it was on. 
that they're building these huge underground bunkers with doors that are 15 feet thick. Why? I think part of, partly because they realize we might have to hide down there someday, <laughs> and they will. This isn't going to keep them from the wrath of the Lamb, but the point is these poor people, these New World Order guys, are going to realize that they have been deceived one day. But it will be too late for them at that point. So what should a Christian do about the New World Order? Well, you should realize that it's part of God's plan. And you should understand that, and you should not fall for this thing that we're going to stop it. We're not going to stop it. Now, should you get upset about unconstitutional laws, the health care reform, and things like that? Yeah. Should you write letters about it? You can. Should you write letters against this gun control issue, against the forced vaccinations, whatever? Yeah. But you shouldn't get sidetracked on that stuff. Don't savor the things that be of men. Savor the things that be of God. The new world order is going to come. It is going to happen. We're not going to stop it. And as Christians, right now, we are... I read a story the one time by Colonel James Bo Greitz and uh, really set me to thinking. There was a mission that he was put on in Vietnam where he was to take a unit of men up onto a hill and they were supposed to hold the ground and draw the enemy out. And then at the last minute, they would send in a helicopter, a bunch of helicopters, and airlift these guys out of there and then come down through with fighter jets and bomb the whole valley and get the enemy. Well, in a way, that's kind of what we're doing right now as Christians. We are to stand our ground. We are to hold the ground until the Lord takes us away, until he catches us away. We're not to retreat. We're not to back off as Christians. We are to hold our ground. And what will end this church age is not the tribulation, is not having to endure to the end to be saved. What's going to end it is Jesus Christ saying, okay, that last soul has just been saved. I'm going to remove my children. God the Father will say, I'm going to remove my children. I'll the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, I'm going to take them out. And now I'm going to pour my wrath out on these people. They're going to get their new world order. It's only going to last seven years. And not even a good seven years. It's going to be part weak, part strong. They're going to get it. And it's going to fail. It's going to be destroyed by Jesus Christ. We'll be coming back with him. And then we are going to be part of his kingdom. And that's a kingdom that will never be defeated. So, stay in the Bible, pray, witness, you know, just do not fall for this whole thing of having to survive and all that stuff. Be about the Lord's work. So that's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.